It's time for the Double Stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I've got drummer Phil Verone. Now, you'll know him from Saigon Kick, uh, but he's also had a bunch of other great projects. He spent some time in Skid Row, recorded a record with him. He's written a book. He's had a stand-up comedy career. He's had a career in the adult film business. All kinds of stuff. So there was a lot of ground to cover, and we covered a bunch. This is a pretty jam-packed hour. On the music side, the big news is that he has announced that he's making a return to music. So you can look probably for that in 2016. Um, and I think he's mulling over a bunch of offers right now. So I'm sure you'll see him out on the stage soon. So let's get right to it. This is my chat with Phil Verone. Um, well, I'm from Long Island, New York, originally. And um, musically, my parents were pretty cool. I mean, they had, um, uh, I mean, they got me like Kiss double platinum for my, you know, graduating sixth grade. Back then, and I'm going way back, we had eight tracks. So uh, my parents are like members of like the Columbia House, uh, you know, record club, and you would get a track sent to you. So it was basically, you know, the, the gamut of, of great music and, you know, everything in the 70s. I mean, I'm going back now to like 78, 77, uh, and it was just really cool. And when I started playing drums back in fourth grade, you know, I used to play the records all the time and it was Kiss. I remember playing to uh, like Sister Sledge and all these really cool bands, Boston. It was really fun, you know, and uh, with that was also a lot of comedy records as well. You know, my parents were very cool, allowing me to listen to Richard Pryor and like Red Fox and Lenny Bruce, even when I was, uh, you know, younger, because I just loved comedy so much as well as music. The comedy that came later in your career, that seeds right back to the early music days as well then. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of everything because, um, uh, you know, I was kind of exposed to the arts, if you will, you know, but when I was a kid and I, and I talk about this, yeah, I think in my book, and I talk about how um, I loved movies, I loved uh, comedy and music, and, and I've been fortunate that I'm able to kind of do each one of them in my career, you know, uh, some more successful than others, but the point is I was able to do it. So yeah, and it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, just being around cool parents and uh, letting me kind of be myself. And when you started playing drums, uh, what was it about drums, and was there a particular influence that led you to that? Um, with drumming, it was um, I, I, you know we had a, we had a choice to play an uh, instrument in um, in the band, and um, uh, for me, I wanted to play trumpet, believe it or not. But because of my it, 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 long story, but basically my ears, uh, I had an issue with my inner ear, so the the doctor said that if I were to play trumpet, that the, the constant pressure of, you know, blowing in this trumpet would hurt my hearing. So instead, we, I, know, I uh, decided to go with drumming with earplugs. So that worked out. And that's really how it came about. It was more an accident than anything. And when you did start playing it, how quickly did you take to it? I, pretty quickly. I, I, you know, I, I played percussion in the, uh, on the orchestra. So it was, um, uh, you know, with the music program in, in the early grades, they teach you how to read music and uh, kind of go from there. And I loved it. You know, I, I, I loved it so much that I convinced my dad and my mom to buy me a drum set. And then, you know, and I tried to, I figured that out. I, I was self-taught and just kind of learned from there. And, um, you know, through the earlier years, I just listened to records and, and played and I just got a feel for it. And then later on, you know, after when I started recording records, um, you know, and I really kind of came to my own sound, my own feel is when I really, you know, knew that it was something for me, you know, because, you know, when you're playing in local bands and, you know, you want to think you're professional, you want to think you're great, you want to think all these things. But when you're, you know, get a record deal and you're in studio and it's time to really kind of cut the tracks, um, that was nerve wracking. But the minute that I, I recorded my first track, I knew that it was for me. You know, I knew, I knew that I was going to be able to do it. You brought something up that I want to talk to you about, which is your style. I think it's difficult yeah. for any musician to have a distinct style and sound. And it's probably right. even more so for drummers because there's probably only a handful. But you definitely have your own style, whether it's the tribal sound or I don't really know how you want to call it. But there's a very distinct style to your drumming. And how did that develop? Well, it's from stealing other people's styles. 
<laughs> Originality is the getting where you stole it from. No, I was, uh, listen, nice. I, I give props to all my uh, to my influences. I'm mean, a you know big Peter Chris fan, big Ringo Starr fan, um, huge Tommy Lee fan, huge John Bonham, Phil Rudd, and then later on I got into Stephen Perkins from Jay's Addiction. Um, big time, uh, you know, uh, Matt Cameron from um, Soundgarden, Manu Kashe, uh, who's uh, played with Peter Gabriel. So I think that as I grew as a drummer, my influences, you know, grew as well. And, and, and yeah, I, I like to say that I took, you know, pieces from each of those drummers and I play them in my style to compliment them. You know, it's like um, when drummers come up to me and say, Oh, wow, man, it's, you know, I listen to your drumming. It's because you're drumming that I play drums. I mean, that's a huge compliment. You know, that, that's, all, that's all a big compliment to me. I felt in the beginning, I almost felt embarrassed, like, wow. Because that, that's a huge, huge thing um, to, to, you know, it's like an honor, if you will. And sometimes you're like, uh, do I even deserve that honor? But I said the same thing to Tommy Lee when I first met him. You know, so it's just it's just the way it goes, and um, I'm I'm very grateful that people actually think I'm that good. That that I would influence them to not only play drums, but a certain style and a certain thing like that. So, uh, but you know, I'm a huge fan too. So I to this day I I'm fans of of great drummers out there, and I learn every day as a drummer. If I hear a drummer play something, you never stop learning. I mean, the minute you think you know it all, you know nothing. So, um, you know, every day I'm learning. And in terms of rock bands, when did you make the switch from kind of high school band into a rock band situation? It was 10th grade, actually. And um, I, was, I was in drafting class. And, and, and the funny part about the whole thing is I never thought I would be a rock star. I mean, to me, it was like it was a hobby. I was going to become an architect. I was on the golf team in high school. I was going to uh, – I had a scholarship. Uh, for college and to to and I really was going to go on the golf pro angle because I I played golf well and I was on the golf team. I mean I you know I couldn't get laid for for anything in high school because I was on the golf team. But I thought <laughs> later on it would be a good future. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, Tom Reinhardt, who I'm still a friends with, he came up to me in drafting class and was like, "I heard you play drums." And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, uh, "Well, I live down the street from you, so you want to jam?" And I said, "Sure," but I don't have a drum set. So he came over with his guitar and, uh, you know, I took my mother's pots and pans out. I know that that's cliche as hell, but it really happened. And um, he played Crazy Train and I was blown away. You know, I couldn't believe that somebody else other than Ozzy could play Crazy Train because that was like my first real, um, you know, like, I guess exposure to, to a guitar player or, or being in a band. And um, from that, I just ended up getting a drum set, and it, it kind of escalated. Played in some local acts, and then um, played the talent show in high school, which was definitely got me laid. And then um, at about 1988, well, when I graduated high school in 85, my parents said to me, like, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I really don't want to go to college now. I, I want to become a rock star. And they went, that's fine, but you got to get a job. So I did. I worked on a lawn service, and in four years, I got a record deal, which is still, like, I can't even believe we did. But um, we formed Saigon Kick in 88 and then went from there. And we kind of took over the South Florida scene. Luckily, it was like a dead scene, and there was nothing going on. So we kind of just took over the place and, and immediately got attention. That's what helped us to get signed so fast. And how did the band come together? It was just we all knew each other. I mean, Jason and I... You know, we played in bands before that, and we hated each other, and he kicked me out of a band, and I kicked him out of a band, you know, and then uh, it was like kind of like that love-hate thing, but we're all kids, and then, you know, I knew of Matt Kramer just, you know, talk around town, and they had another band called, called Toy Soldier that I had seen, and I knew the drummer from that band, so it was kind of like we're all friends in the same music scene, and, uh, you know, and it kind of grew up together, so we all kind of knew each other, and then, you know, when... um I don't remember what the circumstance was, but Toy Soldier ended up breaking up. And then, you know, we decided to put Saigon Kick together. And that was the, 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 the first of it. You know, we just, uh, we put it together and um, uh, just started tearing up South Florida, basically. Now, like you said, it was a small scene and you guys made a big wave in it. I talked to Michael Wagner about that and he talked about how he, you know, saw you guys play 
And then boom, a week later, he had you in the studio. I'm curious of that from your perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't think it was a week later. I think it was like four days, actually. Uh, he, he, but yeah, we, South Florida, I guess it was around, I don't know what happened, but we ended up winning some South Florida Rock Awards, and we ended up in, um, in Billboard, in this little blurb, which ended up on Jason Flom's desk uh, at Atlantic Records, and Flommy sent uh, Dave Feld out to see us play. And Feldy came out and, uh, you know, was raving about this live show. And then uh, we ended up trying to do a demo tape that totally sucked. And basically the deal was come out and see this band live. So at that point we were doing a place called the button South and the button South held about 1500 people. And we, we packed it to the, to the rafters. And, um, so when, when Wagner saw this, he basically, you know, with Jason Flom, they saw this thing. Uh, they said, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to sign it. That's basically what happened. So we were doing the show and um, uh, Flom and Wagner were in the mosh pit. I just remember sitting there playing going, <laughs> I cannot believe that the, you know, the vice president of Atlantic Records is in a mosh pit with Michael Wagner, like one of the biggest producers in history. And right after the show, they came backstage. And we went across the street to a, a little restaurant called Wags or Denny's now, if you will. And uh, they, <laughs> Wagner said, I want them in the studio. That was a Friday. And Monday, well, Tuesday day, I think we're in studio in LA. So it was just like, like whirlwind. I didn't even, I, I don't even, you know, we couldn't even catch our breath. Uh, and I don't think we even realized the magnitude of it either. Because if we stopped to think, if, you know, I probably would have froze and it would have sucked. You know, but we were just like on autopilot and we made it happen. Yeah, you're right. That's probably the best thing that could have happened is that it happens so yeah. fast. You can't overanalyze it because had you even been exactly. in a professional studio at that point, like a real big one? Yeah. No, I, I've had I've recorded before that. It wasn't necessarily. But you got to remember, a professional studio is one thing. Uh, recording a record for Atlantic Records with Michael Wagner producing is another. So, you know, although I, I already had recorded um, I think the pressure of going to like, wow, this is going to be heard now forever. You know, like it is kind of, it was something that, that, that weighed heavy on me and Wagner really helped me out. I mean, I attribute Wagner, my drumming to him. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today because he had so much confidence in my drumming. And the first, first track we did, he, uh, he hit the talk back and he says, I'll buy that for a dollar. And that was it. And, and from that point forward, I had the confidence that I needed. And he sat me down and said, you know, listen, no matter what you think, no matter what happens in this band, know that you're a one quarter of this band. Your sound is just as, as the singers, just as big as the guitar players, is just as big as everybody else. And, and he gave me that talk. And, and that really helped me as a drummer and helped me to this day. You know, when you don't have confidence in certain things, I always think back to the to the great positive influences and Michael Wagner, I have nothing but the utmost respect for that man. I you know without him, I wouldn't be here today. In all honesty. And when the record finished and it came out, how was the response? And how how did you feel about the record when it was done? I thought I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, it happened so damn fast. You know, I mean, we recorded the record in like ten days. It was so fast that I really didn't have time to think. Um, I listened to it afterwards. I thought it was, I thought it was good. I mean, I listen to it now and I wish I could have played better, you know, but what else is new? <laughs> but I think for yeah. a first record, I think it's one of the, I, I, I love the record a, a lot, actually. Um, it, it did okay. Um, it was more critically acclaimed than anything. I think that like any other band, we fell in this weird category with, um, with the, the, the new music coming in, like Nirvana and, and grunge and, and the old hair bands going out, we kind of got caught in the middle of it. And I don't really think anybody knew what the hell to do with us. So we were kind of, you know, in limbo, if you will, until the Lizard record came out and, and Love is on the Way was played on the radio and we got caught up in that whole ballad thing, and, um, you know, which was a blessing and a curse at the same time. Well, let's talk about that. It was a, it was an interesting time because you had all kinds of bands. You had you guys, you had Extreme, you had Mr. Big, you had Queensryche, all these bands that had a massive hit around the same time with the acoustic thing. But yeah. the rest of the record was completely different. You guys, probably more than most, maybe along with Extreme, 
where it was all kinds of different styles, not just, you know, a rock band who also did an acoustic song. Um, right. How was it to have, when you talk about the worst thing that happened, how, how was the response when you went to shows and you started playing everything you guys did, but people were looking for Love Is On The Way? Yeah, it was it was tough. I mean, you know, you got to remember, you have, just like you said, I mean, we had 15 tracks, I think, on, on the Lizard record, and, you know, the only one that was a ballad was Love Is On The Way. And um, not to say that Love Is On The Way was a bad song, it just was just, you know, it just killed us. Because in context to the record, it's a cool, you know, it's a good song. But, in, but, but to represent the record, it was awful. And that's what happened. The same thing happened in Extreme. You know, I mean, they, that, that record uh, that had More Than Words, More Than Words is a great song, but that record is amazing. You know, and they, I remember them having all these returns because people would buy this, the record and be like, you know, what the hell is this? So, and again, this is before iTunes and, and it's before you having a choice to, to buy certain songs, you know, you had to buy the record. Um, and, and the returns were pretty large. So for Psych on Kick, you know, we just came back from, from Mexico um, shooting a, uh, a video for Hostile Youth, which was this really cool, heavy tune. And, and you know, I, I just remember being in London and... I, think, I don't know who it was or the manager. Somebody said, oh, you know, uh, 103 She is playing Love is on the Way. And I just remember looking at Matt, our singer, going, well, our career is over right now. So we just got to ride the 14 minutes and get the most we can out of this and hope for the best. And that's kind of what happened. So we had this whirlwind, you know, number one video, blah, 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 big hit. Uh, you know, we got our 14 minutes of fame. You know, the band, you know, ended up breaking up. Uh, Matt left the band, you know, like this whole thing started that we did the water record. So in, in, in reality, the song did a lot for us and also broke the band up at the same time. Uh, so, you know, what I just did was get into survival mode and go, okay, well, let's utilize the fact that, um, that I am a professional drummer now. And I had a lot of great drummers that you know, looked me up and that were fans of mine. And we had a lot. And I kind of just u- used that to kind of go forward. And, um, and as well as I kind of kicked it. And, you know, we tried our best, but it was, it was, you know, it was a sinking ship, no matter how you slice it. And, uh, and un- it's unfortunate because it's a great band. You know, it's, it's the band that, that, that I think got away because there's no reason why we, could, we shouldn't have sold 10 million records with, you know, with uh, Alice in Chains and all those cool bands that came out because we totally, you know, held our own with those bands. Those were great bands with Soul Side and Kick. You know, we were doing dual harmony vocals. We were doing these great tribal beats and these great things. We just got caught up in Love is on the Way. So, you know, you can't cry about it. I'm, I'm grateful it happened in the respect that we were able to establish. Listen, I got my, my childhood dream and then, you know, once the dust settled, you have to kind of figure out what the next step is. There's a bunch I want to ask you about that that you covered. So um, let's talk about the perception of the band because I know I've talked to this about with Chris and and Jason. It was an interesting thing that you got lumped in with some kind of... Somehow you guys got lumped into hair metal in a way. Like you came yeah. on just at the end of it. But with anybody who knows more than Love Is On The Way... That is so far from what you guys did. Yeah. You know, I would compare you to more like um, uh, Jane's Addiction or something like that. That was sure. would be a bit more close, I think. So there was no reason for you not to ride into the next wave. Uh, in terms of the frustration levels of being class one thing when you know you're something else, how was that for the band? Well, I mean, listen, it, it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because we knew that we were a great band that could easily, you know, held our own with any of those bands. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. It, unfor- unfortunately, we were a casualty of the music business that way. Um, there's many reasons why the band, you know, didn't succeed. Um, the band itself, you know, I mean, we as individuals need to take responsibility. It's not, you know, I'm not going to point fingers at everybody. You know, we had, we had a shitty manager. You know, I mean, I think our manager hurt the band more than anything. If Doc McGee would have managed the band when he wanted to, he had the ability to, um, but instead he was blocked by the manager, our original one, who was like the worst manager in history, who embezzled money from us, uh, lied, stole stuff. I mean, just a big piece of crap as a, as a manager. You know, unfortunately, Saigon Kick kind of rode the cliche 
you know, to, to death, uh, you know, the bad deals, uh, the band infighting in the band, you know, the, the bad management. It's just, it's just everything. Uh, we were doomed from day one, as I say. Uh, you know, the, what saving grace we have out of it is that the band, as individuals, we got really great as players and we were able to really kind of produce some good music. But, uh, but it was frustrating, you know? It was frustrating to see, you know, bands that opened up for us, like Soundgarden and fucking, you know, there was a, Atlantic Records called us and said, hey, we got this new band, SDP, that's going to go out on the road with you and open up for you. You know, those are the bands, and then they blow up to these enormous bands, which they deserve to be, but so did we. So that kind of was a little, you know, hard to swallow, but it is what it is. You know, you can't change history. Um, and what we're noticing these days is a lot of these guys out today are, are, are influenced by Saigon Kick, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty, pretty cool compliment. You know, when you see these bands that are successful now and they, they list you as one of their influences, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. So I think that it's taking years. I know for me, for me to make amends with the music business, which I have, but there was a time when I hated a lot, everything to do with it. You know, it was it was a, a crappy time. So it just took a little little time to get over it. It very much reminds me of King's X in yeah. terms of musicians all know musicians all love it. But, you know, I, I don't think King's X ever ever had the, the big hit you guys had. But still, for the people who really know what the band is, it's kind of inside the little club. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of bands like that. You know, you wouldn't believe how many great bands are out there that no one's ever heard of. And uh, that is a bad club to be in. So uh, we had the one hit at least, you know, and we are in the one hit wonder book, which I think is hysterical. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, at least we had the hit and uh, we got our 14 minutes and, and we go from there. So, you know, a lot of great opportunities happened because of that. Even as crappy as times were, you know, great things happened. So that's what I have to look at and that's what I do look at and, and move forward. So let's talk about the recording of Water because now you're, you're back in the studio trying to follow up, which was still a huge record. And yeah. then Matt's gone. Right. Um, from your perspective, what was the headspace of, of the band? Because I understand Jason became lead singer pretty quick. It was a pretty quick decision. Yeah, I, I think the whole thing was stupid. I think that um, I knew it was going to happen that way. Uh, you know, the, the, again, bad management. And uh, the problem we had was egos beyond, you know, uh, you can even imagine. You had a, a power struggle between Jason and Matt. Uh, you had a manager who was such a waste of life that he couldn't even control what was going on and would just side and do whatever the band, or shall I say, you know, Jason and Matt wanted him to do. And, you know, Matt got pushed out. You know, Jason makes no bones about it that he was an egomaniac. And, you know, I mean, even in the old days, you know, they, they split the band in half before Chris even joined the band. It was all about, you know, Matt and Jason. And they forgot that there was two other people in the band. And, you know, the old saying, 100% of nothing is nothing. Well, that's what happened with Saigon Kick. So when we went to do this, um, the record, uh, it was, they, they wanted to go to Sweden. And I knew that it was a recipe for disaster. What we needed to do as a band was get back into a warehouse and just rehearse music like we did on the first record and get back to why we were loving band. You know, instead, uh, you know, it was Matt and Jason's decision to go to Sweden to basically blow a lot of money and make a crappy record. You know, I mean, that's, that's really what happened because the Lizard record was made in Sweden and it's, it's probably the worst sounding record we have. You know, it's a terrible sounding record, although it has good songs on it. So the Water record why would we go back to Sweden? You know, to me, it was like, let's stay in the States. Let's get back to the roots because there was tension going on in the band already. Uh, but no, you know, everybody had to be exotic and, you know, because Queen recorded in Sweden or whatever. The, the, the problem with Saigon, <laughs> yeah. the Saigon Kick problem is, is that the band wanted to be a lot of things but didn't have the juice to do many things. And by, you know, by, by making a decision of a recording studio, because the Beatles recorded there or whatever, and it was ri ridiculous. You know, we never thought of the band first. It was always about ego. It was about status. You know, it was about this idiot manager who really, using the word manager alone on him is a joke because he's such a waste of life. Um, I, I wish 
that, you know, there wasn't a statute of limitations, so I could put this piece of crap in jail. He's such a pile of garbage, this guy. Um, and, and it's that kind of non-management, letting a bunch of kids make up a decision to, to do whatever the hell we were doing. And that was the downfall of the record. Because when it was all said and done, you know, Jason wanted to write every song on the record and wanted to be, you know, have his name on everything, and Matt got pushed out. So Matt, instead of, you know, dealing with it, left. And uh, with good reason, you know? I mean, that's, that's what happened. Uh, but none of that should have even came to that. It never should have come to that. And, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, but that's pretty much what happens in a band, you know? And then we tried to do a couple of records after that, and... Um, you know, I, I eventually left because I just got tired of the whole, you know, the Jason show. And uh, and just so for the record, I mean, Jason and I are good friends. To, 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 you know, there's no, I have no animosity towards him. I'm just talking about what happened at that time. I mean, Jay and I are, are very good friends. So um, this is not an insult to him or Matt or anybody. I'm just talking about the event at that time. My mindset was that. And, uh, you know, and again, too, you know, I'm no angel, so I take blame as well in a lot of things. Uh, I I should have stood up for myself. I should have said no to many things. I should have, you know, fired our manager. I should have done a lot of things, too, but I did. So coulda, shoulda, woulda is, um, you know, it is what it is. So, but that time was pretty much, you know, the, the definite end of it. I mean, we knew at that point there wasn't much left, so. But you still managed to have a hit in Indonesia, or at least, yeah. you know, so overseas, there is still some response to the record. You know, I have to say, it, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Spinal Tap, you know, when <laughs> Sex Bomb went number one in Japan. And it, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, Indonesia is freaking amazing. And, and we went over there and it was like the Beatles landed. It was almost like, it was, co- it was almost comical because we literally sold out in like, I don't know, how many, like how many hours playing, you know, 15,000 seaters. We go over there. You can't even walk the streets. And it was really nice. It was nice to be a rock star for a week and come home to, you know, <laughs> and not be one. Um, we kind of got uh, the benefits of a rock star with the anonymity of someone who, you know, when you get home, no one really cared. So it was actually kind of cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had some great success over there. But, again, you know, our manager at the time was embezzling money and stole everything, and the band didn't make anything, and he ruined relationships. Uh, you know, I wish I could have enjoyed it more, uh, but uh, when it was all said and done, you know, our managers took our money. So it, it kind of sucked in that regard. Uh, but as far as the experience playing to the Indonesian fans, wonderful fans, wonderful, wonderful fans. It was, it was, it was an honor to play for them and a pleasure. So, uh, and I hope to make it back there again. I really do. I had a great time over there. And then for Devil in the Details, you switched over to CMC. You know, times are definitely changing. Uh, was that manager still involved at that point, or had you gotten rid of him by then? Um, the That manager, unfortunately, stayed for a while. He was kind of attached to Jason. I think Jason had separation anxiety uh, from him because we tried to fire him a couple of times, and it was just to a point where, you know, uh, you know uh, unfortunately for Jason, he's such a talent that he needed, he liked Jason, he liked this guy, that he, everything he told to the manager, the manager did. And I remember when I joined Skid Row, and I was walking with Doc McGee, we're out on a KISS tour, and Doc looked at me and goes, why didn't you let me manage Saigon Kick? I said, I had no idea you wanted to. He goes, yeah, I wanted to manage you guys from day one. You guys would have been a Uh huge band if I managed you. And that got me so pissed off, I could have literally killed our manager at that point. And to this day, it's like, if, if I ever get a terminal illness where I know I'm dying, I'm going to go kill the manager. I, he deserves to die. <laughs> that's how much of a piece of shit he is. Like, th- that's, how, that's how much of a piece of garbage that guy is. Uh, outside of just being a crook and a scumbag, he's just a, just a pile of garbage. You know? The, the, the thing is, is that drug dealers should not be managers. And that's basically all he was. He was a glorified coke dealer that decided that he wanted to manage bands. And we, unfortunately, were the collateral damage of this piece of shit. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, there's a lesson for, for everybody. Uh, before you sign with management, before you do anything, do background check. You know, you got to remember, well, we were kids. We didn't have Google. We didn't have the ability to really look at people. You know, we, we, we just had to trust people. Or, and when you have a scumbag that just basically puts on the good face no matter what, 
and his is embezzling and doing stuff behind your back. And, and our story is no different than Billy Joel's and Sting's and Skid Row. I mean, everybody has gone through this. Um, and unfortunately for us, we weren't, we didn't have the juice as a band or the success to really sustain a hit like that. And, and uh, that was a, a major problem for us. So when the band did break up, or at least you left it, what, what did go down there when the band finally finished? You know, I don't really know. I, I left the band in 96, and then uh, Rachel Bolin and I um, uh, had a band called Pernella Scales that we did a record for um, uh, Warner in Japan. Um, I just walked from it. I, I think they, I want to say they did another record, Bastards, because I know I have one track on that, but I don't really know what happened after that. I know Chris stayed around for the long haul. They tried to do a couple of other bands, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I really, I, it's, it's not my place to talk about it because I don't know much about that. Um, but I do know that they tried a few more uh, times at bands and then eventually Chris left and stuff like that. So that was pretty much it. You know, it kind of dissolved uh, quietly. So how did you and Rachel hook up for Prinella Scales? Well, I know Skids... Oh, man, I met Skids actually when they did the Slave to the Grind record in South Florida. We were just rec we just finished recording the first record. So Michael Wagner was doing Slave record, and we just met them, and we became good friends. I mean, I you know, they were my friends for, geez, what, 10 years or so before I even joined the band. So Rach was uh, doing uh, a punk band, and, uh, you know, I just got out of Saigon, and, and we just started jamming, you know. Wagner was like, you guys need to play together. It'd be a fun band. And that's what kind of came together with that. And we did that record. And then um, when Skid decided to go back out again for the Kiss tour, they needed uh, a drummer. And Rachel called me and said, hey, man, uh, our drummer can't get into... They had, a, they had another guy named Charlie Mills, great guy, really good guy. But he apparently had some, some trouble and couldn't get into Canada. So they they called me and said, uh, you know, Charlie can't get into Canada. You know, would you be interested in playing? We're on the Kiss tour. And I'm like, no, I would hate to do something like that. You know, <laughs> so uh, they, uh, you know, they gave me like twenty something songs to learn, and I and I and I just chopped wood for like two days. Luckily, I was, you know, uh, they were my friends, but I was also a fan of the band, so I knew the material. You know, I mean, how can you not? And um, uh, and and they flew to. North Dakota, I watched Kiss, I watched Charlie play the show, because it was with Kiss, it was, we were only playing 30 minutes with Kiss, as I call it, 1,800 seconds of pure rock and roll, and, um, but, the, but we had our club shows as well, and our club shows were an hour and a half, so we, you know, I had to learn the, the whole set, so we went into Canada, we rehearsed one night, and I believe my first show was in Saskatchewan, if I'm not mistaken, um, I, you know, all of a sudden I'm opening for Kiss. So it was like, what? Just, it was almost like, you know, how Saigon kicked the first record. It was like, what just happened? You know? And uh, it was amazing. And I remembered the next day, I was still kind of like, just, wow, is this even happening right now? Because, you know, when you go out on the Kiss tour, it's like, you know, you meet Gene, you meet all these guys, and you're like, holy crap. I'm like, this is like my childhood is like alive in front of me. How cool is this? You know? And again, it goes back to, the eight track of, you know, double platinum eight track that I got from my parents. And now, wow, they're in front of me. So you never stop being a fan. I don't care what you say, you know? So it was really cool. And um, I'm in the dressing room and I hear the crew, like the crew guys outside going, that drummer that they just got, because they didn't even know me. They're like, that guy's amazing. Like I hear them talking. And I'm like, are they talking about me? You know, like it was really cool because I was so scared <laughs> You know, because the first night I'm playing, it's like I look to the, you know, stage left is Tommy Aldridge, there's, you know, you know, Kiss. They're like all these, and it's like Ted Nugent was on the tour, so I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. This is amazing. And uh, it, it was really something else and something I'll never forget. And, and that just started a seven-month tour with Kiss, and then we continued touring. And then uh, we did um, a Thick Skin record, which is still one of my favorite records I've ever played by far, the Skid Row record. And I just continued touring until I left the band in uh, 05. Now, when you joined Skid Row, did you try to ad play it as as written, or did you try to bring in some of your own style to it? No, I played it just the way um, just the way Rob did it. You know, I mean, uh, I, I was I I love Rob. You know, Rob is a great guy, a friend of mine. I respect him as a drummer. 
and uh, I respect Skid Row, the songs. And, the, and what am I going to play? Any? Why would I play any different? You know, I, 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 I'm a drummer. First and foremost, I, I, I didn't, I don't have to go out there and do drum fills and all this crazy stuff. I was able to play me, play me on the, on the thick skin record. And that was great. But I, there was no reason to play anything else but what Rob had played. I think it was, it was perfect for the band. And it was, it, it was fun to play. Uh, you know, after a time in the band, I felt like they were my songs anyway, even though Rob recorded them. And um, he did the, did the records. I felt so comfortable playing them. I felt like, you know, they were mine anyway. So it really was a good transformation. It was very easy for me to just go right into the band. And knowing those guys and them being my friends also helped as well. So it was just kind of like a band of brothers that just continued. Now, when you were touring with Skid Row, is that when you started doing uh, the documentary? Yeah, we started shooting that like the end, like maybe about 2003, I want to say, like towards the end of 2003, we shot it all 2004, um, you know, and, and we shot during the making of the record and stuff like that. So it was, it was over, the, over the course of a few years, to be honest with you, you know, because it wasn't like we sat down and went, we're going to start shooting it. It was compiled from footage that was already shot, and then we continued shooting when we knew we were going to do it. And, and then for, and for Waking Up Dead, where did that concept come from? I'm curious what gave you the idea to even start filming that. Well, I mean, it was a time in my life. I mean, as a, to, to be honest with you, I mean, it's, it's something I regret doing, Waking Up Dead, because um, I think for, for me it was done too hastily. I think that I was in a, in a, in a mindset that was very much dark and, and, um, and, and, you know, not anything that should have been shot, you know, because when I look back at it now, I'm kind of embarrassed. And uh, I don't feel that way about the music industry. Um, I don't feel that way about a lot of things anymore, but it was a time, you know, I, I just got out of uh, the band. I, I was, you know, I went to rehab, like these whole things. And, um, you know, when they, you just, you, you're a little screwed up in the brain at that point, you know, you need some time. They tell you like, don't make major decisions. Don't, you know, get into relationships. You know, there's a lot going on in your life and, and, and especially leaving the thing that I love the most, uh, music. I was in a definite weird mindset. And I think that, uh, if uh, if I had a chance I, to do it again, I would have done it. I would have definitely just shelved it and not put it out. But but it is what it is. Um, it has helped people, which I I love that. I mean, if if it meant that it helped one person from killing themselves, or or then it's worth it, you know. But in the big picture, you know, people always ask me, well, do you regret anything from touring? And I I regret putting that that movie out because I think that it was disrespectful to the music business. And I think it was just a bad timing because I think I didn't have a chance to really kind of digest and decompress from what was going on in my life. So you kind of got a very raw, uh, more emotional thinking than, than truth, if you will. And why did you leave Skid Row and the music business? I left just to get healthy. I mean, I was on, I was on a collision course out there. Um, you know, the, my world was falling apart. Or it's so so it seemed, you know. As I look at it now, I, it was probably me. You know, I think I think it was more more drama. As they say, they put yeast in the story. I mean, I I, I was um I I wanted I felt that as a as an entertainer that I can do more, uh, not be in a better band or anything like that. I meant just do more in entertainment. I wanted to write. I wanted to act. I wanted to do comedy. Like I wanted to really kind of explore my talents and not just be a drummer. So I really had a great time with Skid Row. It was some of my best years. I, I probably had the most fun ever with those, with those guys. I, I really did. Uh, Cause it was like the big arenas. It really gave me a chance to make money and, and be a rock star and, and play well and get to know a lot of great people. Um, but I thought it was time to like move on and, and try. And I never joined the band or anything. I just, I moved to LA and I started stand up comedy and I started writing, uh, studied script writing, um, you know, started, uh, went to acting school and just went that route and, and had a great time doing that as well. You know, another experience of mine. Your first night up on stand up on stage. How yeah. was that? Was it what you expected it to be? Uh, five minutes and 10 seconds. And I have the video. Uh, it was, it was the most frightening thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, and the most gratifying thing I've ever done in my life. And I highly suggest that everybody, before you die, get on stage and try five minutes of stand-up comedy. It will change your life, period. There is nothing 
that I, I can't even explain what that was like because it was, it seemed it was over in an instant. However, when I walked to the stage, I, I'm still walking to the stage. That's how far of a walk it seemed. Like, no, I'm, you know, it's like walking the plank. And, uh, but it was something that I, I tell everybody. If you have a fear of anything, get your ass on stage and do five minutes of stand-up comedy. That's it. Just go to an open mic and do fucking five minutes. You, if you fail, you fail. And you know what happens? Nothing. That's what happens. You just get back up the next day. And I tell you, man, I loved it. And, and I started doing stand-up. Then I went to the, the uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I thank my great friend, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Craig Gass, who, uh, who told me, like, you got to do stand-up. And if it wasn't for Craig Gass and, and another great comic named Yoshi, those guys really held my hand and took me around the clubs and got me into the, into the L.A. club scene. And uh, I had wonderful help from great comics uh, like Brent Ernst and, uh, and Chris, uh, Chris D'Elia, who's a huge star now, and Whitney Cummings and, and Eliza Schlesinger. Those are all my friends that we did rooms together with. And they're all huge comics now. And it's so cool to see them big stars, you know, because we all started together and we all worked bits out together. And now to see them on te- television, it's like, it's like watching your son hit a home run. You know, it's just really gratifying. And, like, I love those guys. So it's been really fun, and they helped me tremendously. And then I put together the Sex Stand Up and Rock and Roll show at the Improv, and that just became a giant hit. And and that was so much fun. And and I only hosted that. And I said I'll, I'll leave the comedy to the professional. I'll just host this one. And I had a great time doing that. So it was a really cool run in uh, in L.A. And um, uh, with me moving back to L.A., I I would like to start the Stand the Sex Stand Up and Rock and Roll show again at the Improv. Uh, hopefully in 2016, because I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm in the middle of writing a book. So uh, as soon as I get done writing this, um, I plan on uh, uh, doing the, the stand-up again. And what was that show? It was a variety show. It was called the Sex Stand-Up and Rock and Roll Show. I had comics. I had a variety acts. I had a all beautiful, hot rock band, uh, an all-girl house band called Just the Tip, and they shredded. They were amazing. <laughs> and... Um, I had, uh, at the end of the show, I had my rock star friends come up and I would play drums and, and like my buddy Life Garrett sang songs, uh, uh, Phil Lewis from LA Guns. Uh, we just had a great time, you know? Um, but during the show, I gave out gift bags of adult toys. We had rock stars, porn stars. The crowd itself was so insane that like what it ended up being was that, that all the comics in town were like, I got to get on for our own show. So I would have my lineup, but then like David Tell would come in and go, hey, I got a special. Can I do like 12 minutes real quick? And I'm like, sure, go ahead. You know, and all these big comics, you know, uh, uh, Dom Herrera, Norm MacDonald, you name it, they came on and did my show because the crowd was so energetic. As I say, they heckle with you. And it was so much fun. Um, and, and, and I take pride in this. It was, it was sold out every time I did it. It was 220 people. And we had... Oh, that's one, pretty good. Yeah, in one night, our drink tab was higher than the whole weekend of the three shows per night for the weekend. Because it was just a rowdy, it was rock stars, porn stars, celebrity, Adam Sandler came out to the show, Kevin James, you name it, they were in the audience. It was just one of those really cool, exciting things. And, um, you know, I always wanted to put that show in Vegas into a, a hotel. And maybe one day we will, but I think I think it's time to... Yeah, kind of put it back into the uh, into the improv over in uh, in California. So we'll see what happens. That's such a great blend too. I can yeah. see why that would be successful. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a PT Barnum fan. You know, when when he, when it's all said and done, and Doc McGee told me this a long time ago, just be PT Barnum. You know, I mean, if you bring it, they'll come. You bring some entertainment, they'll come. He did that with the side shows. He did that with a circus. I mean, he was the first one to do a beauty contest. You know, not the first, you know, real beauty contest was P.T. Barnum in the 1800s. It's like, these guys, it, it's like, when you look back at it, but I was also a huge fan of variety shows. I loved, you know, uh, uh, the old variety shows, you know, like Milton Berle and, and Sid Caesar, uh, all the good stuff from the old days. I mean, they don't make it like that anymore. So I, I was a big fan of that. That's my father, influence, you know, watching that stuff, the, 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 uh, the uh, Dean Martin roast. I loved all that stuff. So I wanted to bring that into a modern time. And that's how it kind of, you know, that was basically the catalyst of the show. 
And after that show finished up its run, is that when you made the switch over into the adult film business? Yeah, that was kind of like a weird thing. It was I, I did I did that really bad TV show, uh, the Dr. Drew show, and then I did Playgirl. I, I, you know, like I don't even know how all this stuff. It just kind of happened that way. And then before you know it, I'm like on the phone with Vivid talking about a celebrity sex tape. When that came out. Uh, then uh, Steve Hirsch from Vivid asked me about doing my own series, a uh, swinger series, because I was in the lifestyle. We did that. That became like a huge hit. And that really was the catalyst to that. So that was like five years ago. I'm, I'm now out of the adult industry, but, but um, it was, it was a fun run. You know, it was fun directing and writing movies and stuff like that. Um, it wasn't until I opened up the agency side, when I tried to be an agent that I realized how shady the business was. And, um, you know, I needed to get out of it. And that's what I did. So when you started doing the actual behind the scenes work for films, directing and whatnot, like, I don't care if it's a porn or if it's a different kind of film, it's still directing. It's still, you yeah. know, action cut angles, whatnot. So where did that knowledge come in that you could step in and be a director? Did you shadow somebody for a while or, or how did that work? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I... I guess I kind of tapped into the years of doing videos. Um, you know, at, at that point I was, I was acting, so I had some acting parts. Um, I, I don't know. I just, it just kind of came real natural. It's hard to really say, uh, in no way am I Martin Scorsese, but on the same token, I also write, you know, I, I studied script writing, so I know what I want to hear out of people's mouths. Uh, I know it looks right. I know, you know, what blocking a shot is and, and all this stuff. So when it, when it looks good in, in, you know, through the camera and it sounds good, it's good. And that's how it, I, I really can't explain it. I guess if I went to film school, I could kind of learn how to do what I do. But I also believe that um, not knowing things makes something special. If, if the Beatles knew, you know, more, more about music theory and all these other things, maybe they wouldn't have written the songs that they did, you know, or vice versa. So I kind of like, I don't know, I just kind of fell into it. And, and um, to me, it's, it's, it's the creative process is, is you know, it, writing something like, like, like one of my biggest compliments to this, compliments to this day, accomplishments, is writing uh, a book and being published author. To me, that's, you know, that's up there with my kids being born and, uh, and, and, and my, my daughter graduating, you know, FSU with honors. You know, my book is one of the most proudest moments of my life um, because uh, to become an author is an elite thing to me. Uh, not everybody can write. You know, people can play drums. Don't get me wrong. You know, we could, but writing a book is, is something really special. And, and um, to be told that I have that talent uh, it was pretty amazing. And, um, and to me, if you have a talent for something in the arts, you find that you can pretty much put that talent into other things, you know, in no way would I ever direct a Hollywood blockbuster, but you know, I would definitely direct an indie film. You know, I've run and I write all the time. I've written many movies, many screenplays. I would, I would easily be able to direct a, you know, independent feature or something like that that's written from the heart that I, you know, that I'm part of. Uh, so I think, you know, the arts, you can just kind of, you know, go over. And also I'm a guy that, uh, that watches and learns. When I worked with directors, I looked at them, I watched what they did. I watched what happened around. I watched who did what on the crew. You know, it's just being observant and, and, and not lazy. And I think you can do anything for that matter. Now, writing a book, well, it's very easy to start writing a book. It's not so easy to actually get through and finish it. Yeah. <laughs> How big of a mountain was that to put together? Real easy, actually. I, I find writing is uh, writing's an interesting thing. I'm writing a book right now. Um, uh, I'm a ghostwriter on a book for a very famous comedian who has passed. I can't say who it is because I've been, I signed a, uh, a non-disclosure, but basically... Um, uh, it's going to be, it's pretty amazing. I was just talking to Chris McLernan tonight and I was like, man, I am so grateful to be part of this project because it is so much of a responsibility to tell this, this person's story. Uh, and I'm doing it through his family and it's pretty amazing. All uh, um, right. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 yeah. The thing is like, um, uh, when you, when I write, 
I sit down and write, or I don't. So it's really kind of like, okay, when I, when I wrote my first book, it just flows out of me. Again, I can't explain what happens. I don't really know. I just know that when I write, I write good. You know, and, and that's, that's it. It's just really, I don't know what the hell to say about it. It's, it's kind of like either the way that I write. Uh, I remember when, when my agent, my book agent was trying to get me a, a, a publishing deal years ago. And we had literally 50 no's. And not because of the way I wrote, but because of the content. Because I was writing about, you know, crapping on a bus. You know, I was writing tour stories. So, you know, you know, these, these wonderful executives, like, you know, vice president of Simon & Schuster, you know, write and come back and go, oh, this guy is a great writer, but I can't, I, he goes, I laugh reading this stuff, but there's no way we can release this material. You know, like, it's that kind of thing. So the, the actual turndowns were wonderful. You know, like, it, it wasn't like, oh, this guy sucks, so, you know, keep his day job. He's like, this is a really great writer. However, when he writes something we can release, we'd love to have it. It's like kind of like one of those things. Uh, so I just really love it. And, it, you know, um, I use an old Dell computer to write on it. It's missing a K. Um, I think it's like 15 <laughs> years old. It, I think it's like the speed is like 155 megahertz or something. You know, it's like it literally, is, you know, you, it's just one of those computers that I'm so comfortable writing on it. And, and uh and, and it goes in spurts. I mean, the book that I'm writing now is very important. So when I interview the family and I have to write it in the family's point of view, or, you know, um, and, and their voice, it's, it's something that's um, when I send over the pages and they approve, it's something real special, you know, and, and uh, the other day I came up with a title. It just hit me and it was, oh my, you know, it just blew me away. And then you get the approval from the family and you're like, all right, cool. You know, it's a little different than writing your own book because your own stuff, you know, I'm just, I just literally sit down and just start, you know, throwing stuff up. I mean, words fall out of me, you know, like, uh, like, it, or I just get a complete mental block. I guess it's the same as like writing music or whatever. Uh, for me, words seem to flow and I have a way with them. Um, and uh, things have to inspire me. It's really kind of, you know, and today was an inspirational day. I, I wrote all day today. So it was actually very cool. And, um, and these are the days I cherish. But the other day, I wrote maybe like 200 words, but they were 200 quality words. So it really, you kind of have to you know, pick and choose what your goals are. Uh, I'd much rather write 200 quality words than 2,000 shitty ones. So you, you know, and, and that's how I do it. And uh, you know, it's very rare that you get goosebumps when you're writing. And today was one of those days. And, and it was just like, oh, this is going to be good. You know, because this one has, this one has the potential of a bestseller list, which my agent, my agent says, like, you need to be on that list. This is your chance. So, you know, and that's, that's what's really exciting because when you get down to the dumps and you have a great agent that just like says, listen, you can do this, just get in there, you know, and do it. Um, cause it's scary. This is like, you know, again, this all goes back to the first day I recorded a song in, this, in the real studio. You know, it's like my words now can be read by everybody. You know, you can go on Amazon and buy my book and read my words. You can call me a hack or you can do anything you want, but it's very personal. Um, and, and that's, that's basically what this business is. You know, you're judged for everything you do. The last thing you do, especially. I would imagine there's a great sense of responsibility when you're writing somebody else's story. It's huge. It, especially this story, because when this thing comes out to say that this person was not a huge star, enormous, enormous celebrity, an enormous impact uh, on comedy, enormous uh, change comedy. That's a big, that's a big, big responsibility. Um, and it's quite fascinating because uh, with a celebrity of this status, his friends, the stories about the friends that are enormous stars that I'm fans of is even better. So you're hearing all of this and you're looking at it in pictures and you're like, you've got to be kidding. You know, um, it's a tremendous responsibility and, and, uh, and, and, you know, frightening at the same time. So, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm up for the task and, and so far they haven't fired me yet. So I think I'm doing something good. So that's a good thing. Obviously you can't share who it is, but can you share how you got the gig? 
Uh, it was, it was, it, you know, again, and I look at everything this way, it was a mistake, really. I was, it, it, this is how bizarre this happened. And this is why I'm a universe guy. I'm not religious in any way. I'm a universe guy. So I believe that everything happens for a reason. There are no mistakes. Uh, so, so I was, I was at a, a office depot buying printer ink. And, the, and this person approached me and said, you look really familiar. I, you know, I don't really, I can't place you. Are you from L.A.? I said, well, you know, I used to live in L.A. And they said, well, have you ever done comedy? I said, actually, yeah, I did stand up and, and I had a show at the improv. And they said, that's where we saw you. We saw you at that show. And I said, yeah, it was, you know, it was great. We, we talked a little bit and we went on our business. About two weeks later, I get an email on Facebook and, and it's the person. And, and, and they say, hey, uh, you know, I ran into you at, at, the, at the office depot. Um, you know, do you remember me? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, this is great. You know, it's nice to talk to you again. And um, they said, listen, I've been reading your stuff on Facebook because I write crazy posts on Facebook. You know, I, that, that's what I do. And they, they said, you know, you're a really great writer. Um, do you, would you ever consider writing for somebody? I said, well, sure. I have a book out now and everything. And uh, long story short, um, she says, uh, I don't think you know who I am. However, let me explain what I have going on here, and maybe you can help me out. So then she began to explain who she was. And at that point, I knew exactly who she was. I didn't put the name together because it was, you know, at that point, it, you know, this happened you know, years ago. Um, that's really how it came, came together, by the universe. Or, or as, as we say, it, was, it had to do with the comic, that, you know, <laughs> from, that, apparently, because it, 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 seemed, it seemed to work that way. But uh, it, it's, it's a tremendous honor, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's going to be something special, I can tell you that. It's killing me. I want to pry more out because I'm really curious who it is, but yeah. I'll respect it. I'll, I'll move on, but that's brilliant. Yeah, I cannot say who it is. No, even if you t said the name, I couldn't say who it was. So, Fair enough. Okay, so the agency. You mentioned you had an agency for a little while and that you know you saw the dark side of the industry and, and you shut yeah. it down. Yeah. Why did you want to – like what was it about the agency that made you want to start it? And then – what can you share about you know shutting it down? Well, I, I mean, I started it because I was I was naive to the business. I thought that I could do something different. You know, I, I heard the horror stories about um, you know the talent talking about their agents and how they got screwed over and the agents are scumbags and, and they're not licensed and all these things. And I wanted to go in there and try to change things, do good business, and take care of people because I was you know unlike those agents, I, I actually was a celebrity and I actually had an agent where, you know, these idiots are just scumbags that are criminals that decide to be agents. And um, that's what I learned later. So um, uh, I realized that there's no way to make any money in this business. It's, it's unregulated in the agency side, uh, unless you're, you're, you know, making your girls escort, which I, I won't do. You know, I, I don't get involved in that part of it because it's illegal. I don't think escorting should be illegal, but since it is illegal, I cannot dabble in that in any way. Um, I just, you know, I just, you cannot compete with scumbags. You know, you, you it's kind of like, uh, it, it, when you think about, um, uh, you know, kamikaze pilots, how can you beat somebody that doesn't care about dying? Well, in this business, in the, in the industry, in the adult industry, how can you beat someone that doesn't care about doing anything that they can to screw you up or rock you or, you know, steal your, your clients. And it just was a really seedy business. And, and quite frankly, uh, I'm, been, you know, they're beneath me. You know, I mean, I really broke it down. I don't want to sound like a, you know, a narcissist or, 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 you know, an elitist. But the bottom line is, is that I became my career that I got was because I worked hard for it and I had a talent. These assholes that call themselves agents that would would be in my same circle are useless crooks that wouldn't have, that can't do anything with their lives. They have no talent other than screwing people over. And don't get me wrong, there are some really great people. I met some wonderful people. One of my friends who's an agent really kind of helped me along, and she was like a, an amazing person. But for the most part, everybody I met was a total scumbag. And, you know, they're, 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 they're patting you back with one hand and stabbing you with the other one, you know? And uh, it was just, it was the amount of stress that I dealt with on a daily level, on a daily basis was beyond anything. I, I started looking like Obama, 
you know, like I got grazed. I mean, it really took a toll on me. And um, I just said, you know what? I'm, I, I'm too good for this business. You know, the porn business is the last stop on the train to, to nothing, you know? And I think it's a good business to the fact that you can really, you know, if you go into it the right way, you can make some money, you can do well for yourself. But in general, it's unregulated as far as the business end of it. Um, and it's unregulated in all aspects. It, you're basically, it's the Wild West, and there's no um, uh, guarantee of ever making money because the, the talent can leave you, the, the, the studios can rip you off, there's no respect, there's no loyalty. It's just a really shady, bad business, and it's sad because it could be a cool business because it still makes money, you know, and, uh, but because it's sex, you know, that, that attracts the scumbags, and that's basically what it is. So you shut down the agency, and then you very quickly after that announced a return to music. Yeah, I kind of had, you know, I, I just had my thing where, you know, friends for years have been telling me, dude, why don't you play drums? You're a great drummer. That's where you made your money. I'm like, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to be in a band. And then after this experience, I guess, you know what I equate the, the, the adult business with? Um, when a drug addict has it, hits rock bottom, I think career-wise, my rock bottom was the adult industry. And by getting rid of it, as I call it, my douching, I did a douching and douched the industry, douched everybody. Um, that kind of cleared my soul. It, it, it literally allowed the good to come in. And I needed to do that. And I realized then, I was like, I, 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 I need to play drums, you know? Because I look at the adult industry and not one person in that industry can call themselves a, a, a rock star. No one can call themselves a published author. No one can call themselves anything but a, you know, uh, that had to do in, with legitimate stuff. It's all, you know, and that's what I really, I kind of had to find myself again. I go, what? I, you know, I, I miss what I do, which is uh, entertaining, performing for people, and playing my drums. And that's what I want to do. So that, that was the big thing, and I kind of had an epiphany. I, I made amends with the music that's on Facebook one, one morning. It was like a Sunday morning, and I just started writing. And I'm like, what is this coming out of me? This is so bizarre. And I let it stick, and that was it. That was my, my comeback to music, and, it, and the fans have been wonderful. I have to say, I have, like, the greatest fans. They, they're just so supportive and very cool, and I couldn't do it without them. And, and the industry itself is embracing me. I have band offers, you know, nonstop, great musicians asking me to do stuff. Um, and I'm writing this book now, and then you'll see a lot of me in 2016. That I can just show you of. Now, when Saigon Kick reunited and you were part of it, that was kind yeah. of before your big announcement, but then you also left uh, yeah. very shortly before you, you know, within a couple of months later, you're back. So can you tell me about the reunion and then why you left the band? Um, yeah, I just I just felt that um, I wanted to do a little more with the band, you know, playing wise. And um, the time, the Saigon Kick shows were good, were good, but they really weren't going anywhere for me. And I love the guys. I mean, I have nothing against the guys. I love them to death. Just, to, you know, just talk to um, Matt today. You know, uh, Chris, I talk to him almost every day, Jason. It's nothing about that. I just, I just felt I can do something a little better, you know, and, and they're, they're not really doing much. They're just playing here, shows here and there, and I just really don't want to do that. If I'm going to commit to something, I really want to commit to something and, uh, and, and do something with a little more, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, just, it's, it's just, I don't want to play Florida every, for every shoot, every gig. You know, it's like, uh, I, 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 it's, you know, Com comically, I you know I told Jason I'm like, do I got to get you guys a map in the United States? You know there are there are other states out there other than Florida, but um, you know kiddingly of course. But it's like uh, I'm just really happy where I'm at right now. Not to say I would never play with them again. I would you know I mean I love the band, I love the guys. They're my they're my brothers. You know I mean those guys we we have been through thick and thin. Uh, I would take a bullet for those guys. Um, so if it happens again, cool. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But um, you know, at this point, uh, I'm just writing and, you know, they haven't asked me. So, uh, and I talk to them daily. So it's not like it's, you know, a big deal. So we'll see what happens. You know, you never know. Uh, I, I, I definitely will, I will say, I mean, I, I would entertain playing with them again, not necessarily as a full-time band member, but to play a gig here and there would be fun. You know what I mean? The fans ask for it all the time. I would do it for the fans. That'd be fun as hell. As long as Chris is playing, you know I mean? I wouldn't do it without without the, the, us four, you know, it would have to be us four, 
But um, but uh, if that happens, cool. And if it doesn't, well, so be it. No, you know, no harm, no foul. Right. So if if perhaps they did decide they're going to take the reunion a bit more seriously, like I know you just said, you, you know, a show here, a show there. But if they did decide, okay, we're going to do it for real, and we're going to do, we booked a, you know, two month tour or something like that, where it's a bit more steady work. Yeah. That would probably be a bit more appealing. Yeah, than- I would. I mean. Would- yeah, I'd like to do a new record. Um, you know, the next things I do, I want to record again. I want to, you know, get back out there and, and do something fresh and do and play some shows. Sure. I mean, that's open for discussion. I mean, we talked about that way, way earlier, and that kind of fell to the wayside because we're all busy. You know, each one of us has a career. Um, it's really tough when you have four people that are really working a lot to, to put the time and effort into it. So um, to get that commitment out of out of individuals is hard, and 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 uh, and I and understood, you know, I, I don't use that against anyone, but in this case, we would have to literally put our time and energy into like I can't 100, percent and that's kind of tough to do these days, you know. Um, so you have to come up with a happy medium, and whether that happy medium ever happens or not is the question. But until that happens, you know, like I said, they're my friends, they're my brothers, I love them to death. You know, and uh, that's never going to change. If we uh, ever play again, I think it'd be good for the fans. The fans ask me about it all the time, and uh, and if we don't, then we don't. You know, and I've already talked to Jason about writing uh, some new music because I'm uh, working with another. There's a super group that we're putting together. I cannot talk about who's in it because I know you're going to ask, <laughs> but I can't talk about that because everybody's in band. But I asked Jason if he would like to write with us, you know, and, and come down and jam as well. So, I mean, I want to work with Jason again in some, in some capacity. So uh, that, that definitely could happen as well. I saw that there was a, a show announcement with you playing in, a, in Vegas with some of the guys from LA Guns. Is that still happening? Yeah. Un- unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm going to be doing a, a record in Nashville. And uh, I'm doing a record for a new artist. Um, and that would be my, my first time playing back. So uh, as it turned out, scheduling wise, originally I was going to do it, but I can't do it uh, now. So unfortunately, because uh, I, you know, those are good guys. I like those. Uh, Still, Lewis, a great, great friend of mine. It was going to be a fun jam because I love jamming with all those cats in Vegas. You know, uh, uh, the sinners and all those guys. It's really fun. But unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it. So, uh, but you know, who knows? It's something next. It's all about scheduling. But, uh, but it, it definitely was. I was looking forward to it. It would have been a fun time to play. So. And that record in Nashville, would that happen to be with Michael Wagner then? You know, uh, Michael is being talked to about recording, about you know playing it, so, uh, producing it, I mean. So I don't know. It would be, it would be I would hope so. And again, it's still in like the scheduling wise, um, you know, and I'm going back and forth with songs right now. And I would love it because Michael was there for my first time ever recording. And I would love for him to be the first producer that records me back in the business. It would be full circle for me and pretty cool. That would be a special thing for me. So we'll see what happens. Now, as we finish up, your career has been so widespread. You've touched upon so many things. When looking back at what you've accomplished to date, how you know how does, how much does it please you to have dabbled and had success in so many different areas? I think it's great. I mean, I'm probably one of the most successful people on pa- paper. I just need to make money. <laughs> but um, no, it's 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 yeah. I mean. It's been wonderful. I, I, like I said before, I mean, I don't regret many things. I mean, the, the movie, yes. I mean, but in general, it, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. As cliche as that sounds, there's times where I thought this, this whole thing was going to kill me, but it never did. And uh, I just took the best out of it. And I think I'm the better person for that. And um, I look forward to the future. I mean, I don't even know. I take everything daily. You know, I, I, um, I'm excited about this new project. I'm excited about this 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 uh, book i'm excited about drumming again and uh and that's good that's a good thing and we'll see what happens you know opportunities knock every day so you know whether i decide to take something or not really really depends on the day and what's going on and if the opportunity is right for me so i think that my career has got me to this point and i'm very grateful for that so I, I have a track record. I, you know, people know my talents. They know that I'm a nutcase too. So I mean, they got to <laughs> weigh it all in, you know. And and you get the good and the bad. Uh, hopefully, the the good outweighs the bad. But um, but I look forward to whatever uh, you know this crazy universe brings me. Phil, thanks so much for taking the time. It was a real treat, and you seem in a real good place these days. Oh uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for. Uh, for letting me yap for the last hour. But yeah, I'm in a great place. I really appreciate it. And I just want to tell everybody, you know, and I, 
and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I just want to thank everybody out there, the fans. They've just been so wonderful. You know, the business itself, it's just been a really pleasant uh, uh, transition back into it, you know, and, and I think that having a, a, a really good support team like these, these fans and, and, and my family and all this stuff has really helped me uh, uh, tremendously. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I just say, bear with me, because 2016 is going to be fun, especially this book, and I can't wa- not wait for the day that I can start talking about it, because I think it's going to be pretty special, and people are going to be shocked by uh, what it is. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and also, you know, philbarone.com, I just launched. You can get me on, the, uh, on Twitter as well, and, of course, on Facebook. You know, you, 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 I'm not hiding. Everybody can get me. So, uh, you know, by all means. Look me up, say hello. I always answer back, and I appreciate everything. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. For those new to the show, you can check out thedoublestop.com. All the back episodes are there, and there are a ton of them. And all my social media links are there as well. And if you want to help out and donate to the show, there is a PayPal button there. Helps cover some of the costs that I incur every month by doing the show. Thanks again for listening. I'm Brian Sword, and I'll be talking at you again next week.